My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York and today again I wanted to do another video on the pills, pills and more pills series. In this video I'm going to talk about life prolonging medications and I'm going to try and explain to you how to understand uh, medications that are purported to prolong life and how sometimes the benefits of such medications are greatly over exaggerated by pharmaceutical companies to try and sell more drugs. Um, before we start, I just wanted to let you know we only have six days left for registrations uh, for the Heart Health Seminar in New York. On the 4th and 5th of August, I will be in Westchester, New York, and I will be hosting a seminar in which I'll be talking about a variety of heart health conditions. And on the 5th of August, I will um, <clears throat> be offering free one-on-one -on -one consultations to anyone who has reserved uh, before the 30th of August. Uh, so if you happen to be in the area, please uh, consider registering and it would be great to meet you. Uh, the way to register is to visit www.hearthealthweekend.com. Now, let's just talk about pills, pills and more pills, all right? So uh, as you know, the first thing I've said uh, in my first video was that we're giving too many pills and I don't think these pills necessarily give us the benefits that they are sold to us as um, you know we're they're sold to us as being more beneficial than they actually are uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that uh, pills should only be taken for one of two reasons either because they prolong life or reduce the risk of something bad happening to us or secondly if they in some way improve quality of life today I'm going to talk about medications that are purported to prolong life the first thing to understand about life prolonging medications as is that uh, as individuals we really cannot measure our length of life because the only time you can reliably measure your length of life is after your life is over and because you cannot measure your length of life you cannot categorically work out whether something has prolonged your life all right it's as simple as that so when we take a life prolonging medication uh, a supposedly life prolonging medication, we will never know whether that has prolonged our life because how do we know how long we would have lived without it? And therefore, how can we tell that we have lived longer because of it? So the problem there is that because we can't measure it, we have to rely on evidence uh, from somewhere else that has been tested out in somewhere else in some in someone else and the best way to accrue this evidence is to see if it has been tested out in a population of people who are just like us okay so um <clears throat> what you want is uh, three things uh, when you're thinking of life prolonging medication the first is that there is some evidence to show that it uh, prolongs life. I would never take something that uh, someone says, oh yeah, take this and it'll make you live longer. How do I know? What is the evidence? Has it been tested out in a population of people who are just like me? Uh, and if it hasn't, then how can I be sure? So the first thing you want to know is make sure that there is some evidence base behind it. And the second thing you want to know is that you want to make sure that that evidence base has been collected in a large number of people, all right? Uh, not a small number of people. So, for example, if someone says, yeah, we tested it out in 10 people, that doesn't tell you very much at all. But if you, if someone says, yes, we've tested it out in a million people and consistently uh, the uh, population that takes this medication seems to, in general, uh, have more people living at the end compared to the population that doesn't, then that fills us up with a lot more confidence. And the third thing you want is you want to make sure that that has been replicated in multiple studies. Uh, so just one study, how can you be absolutely sure? But if the study has been repeated by different uh, centers, different groups, different researchers, and you find the same results, then you can be a lot more confident that that does um, in some way prolong life. Uh, so you definitely need that evidence base and there is no harm when you're talking to your doctor to say, OK, what is the evidence base for this? What is the evidence base? The truth is that it is not the case that just because you take a medication, it will definitely prolong life. So, for example, 
if you take something like blood pressure tablets and people say, well, take blood pressure tablets because if you don't take them and your blood pressure is high, you will have a stroke. This is not true. OK, if you take a population of people with high blood pressure and a population of people with normal blood pressure and you follow them up over a period of time, it does not follow that everyone who has the high blood pressure will have a stroke and everyone who has a normal blood pressure will not have a stroke. What will actually happen is that you will have people who have high blood pressures who have strokes and you will have people who have high blood pressures who don't have strokes and you will have people who have normal blood pressure who will have strokes and you will have people with normal blood pressure who don't have strokes. The only difference is that when you count the numbers at the end, you will probably find that there will be more strokes in the group of people who have had the high blood pressure compared to the group of people who have not had the high blood pressure. But there will only be a number. So the larger that number, the larger the difference, uh, the more the, the more beneficial the medication. Uh, now, the problem uh, with a lot of the pharmaceutical companies is that they overinflate figures. OK, so let me give you an example. Let me uh, talk you through this because they, they let's see. Let's take 100 people with high blood pressure. OK, so you don't treat them. And this is hypothetical. Take 100 people with high blood pressure, which you don't treat. You follow them up and you see what happens to them after five years. And let's say at the end of five years, 10 out of those 100 people have had a stroke. OK, then a pharmaceutical company comes along and says, look, we have this wonderful drug which will hopefully reduce strokes. So you give 100 people with a high blood pressure the medication and you give 100 people with high blood pressure no medications and you follow them up over five years. And let's say what you find is that in the group that you have not given any medications to, 10 people have had a stroke. And in the group that took the medication, only five people have had a stroke. So the pharmaceutical company will then say that actually the risk of stroke has been halved. There's, it's been slashed by 50% because in one group, 10 people had a stroke. And when we gave them our medication, only five people had a stroke, which means that the risk has been halved. And so we would, as um, as the audience, we would look at that and say, wow, that's really impressive. Our, our risk is halved if we uh, take this medication. All right. Now, the truth is, actually, all you've done, all the medication has done is it's uh, prevented strokes in five out of a hundred people. <clears throat> so the true uh, benefit of the medication has been five percent, not fifty percent. Okay, uh, because all you've done is you've prevented strokes in five people, uh, and therefore the the real benefit of the medication is a five percent improvement in in reduction in strokes, not a fifty percent reduction as the pharmaceutical company will make you believe. But based on that figure of fifty percent, more people would then be thinking, "Oh my God, I better reduce my risk of stroke." Now let's think of it again. Let's say you are now dealing with a million people. Okay, so you take a million people uh, with untreated high blood pressure. Okay, you follow them up, and after five years. 10 people have had a stroke. Now, if you take another million people and you give them the medication and you follow them up after five years and you find that um, <clears throat> five people have had a stroke, then the pharmaceutical company will still say, oh, we have reduced the risk by 50 percent. Ten people died in that group. And five people died in this group. But actually, think of this you've only saved five lives in a million people. OK, so the the absolute benefit of this medication is tiny, tiny. Uh, the idea that you treat a million people for five years on medications to prevent five deaths is tiny. Th these are hypothetical figures, but I'm just trying to explain this difference between relative risk reduction, which is what pharmaceutical companies use to produce these headlines, you know, Taking an aspirin reduces your risk by 30 percent. Taking a statin reduces your risk by 30 percent. And the true benefit of the medication, which is far less, because when you look at the absolute values, it's far less. And therefore, a better way to try and work out whether your medication is going to do you any good is to calculate this absolute risk. And 
one of the ways to calculate the absolute risk is to use a, a figure called the number needed to treat. How many people do you need to treat to prevent one bad thing happening to them, be that death or a heart attack or a stroke? Okay, so I'm going to give you some figures just to make you understand this. If now aspirin people take aspirin you know people are given aspirin oh aspirin reduces heart attacks if you've never had a heart attack before and you take aspirin the number needed to treat the number of people needed to treat to prevent one non-fatal heart attack is 1667 so your chances of benefiting from aspirin by taking it for a whole year is one in 1667 Imagine that. That is a tiny benefit. Tiny. Is it worth taking this agent for a year if that's the only benefit you're likely to get? But we give it. This is, you know, and therefore, again, I say, well, you know, when I'm when I'm faced with patients um, uh, who are given aspirin just because, oh, it's beneficial. The truth is the benefit is tiny, hardly anything at all. And therefore, people who have never had heart disease or stroke disease don't need aspirin. It is not something that benefits them in any way whatsoever. Similarly, with statins, you know, we we um, um, we recommend statins in people. You know, cholesterol is high. Uh, let me just quote to you: If you are at low risk of having heart disease and you have a high cholesterol, then actually, you, do you know the number needed to treat? to prevent one non-fatal heart attack is 217. 217 people need to be treated for five years on statins to prevent one non-fatal heart attack. 313 people need to be treated for five years on a statin um, to tr prevent one non-fatal stroke. And actually, there is no significant mortality benefit in um, uh, people who are at low risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, if you look at a Mediterranean diet, for example, so uh, what is the number needed to treat Mediterranean diet? Actually, it emerges that you have to treat 61 people for five years on a Mediterranean diet to prevent one death. Compare that to a statin where you have to treat one, 217 people to prevent a non-fatal heart attack. So this then just starts going to starts beginning to tell you that actually when you start looking at numbers needed to treat, you have to treat an enormously large number of people to gain any kind of benefit. So the absolute benefits of these medications is very low. And actually the benefits from things like dietary modification, regular exercise, getting good sleep is far greater than the medications, um, than the uh, benefits from these medications. The other thing I would like to say is that often what uh, we tend to do in the medical field is we extrapolate data. So if an agent has been shown to prolong life in a study uh, and that study was done in a 40 year old uh, population of 40 year olds, we take that and we say, oh, we'll apply it to other subsets. OK, so but the truth is you cannot apply this to subs uh, other subsets. So if you have, for example, a 90 year old patient, the truth is there is no medication that will guarantee that that person will definitely get to 91. It just doesn't happen. If you had a 40 year old, maybe you will see that benefit, but in a 90 year old, you won't. So this idea of giving 90 year olds life prolonging medications is incredibly, um, is incredibly flawed because the truth is that once you get to a certain age, all that should matter is quality of life. The chances that I'm not saying that you should deprive them of medication, but what I'm saying is that the benefits are so incredibly small and probably non-existent that it just does not seem like it's a sensible thing to do, which is to overload them with medication and actually uh, expose them to the risk of side effects, expose them to the indignity of having to take so many tablets, destroy their quality of life for a benefit that does not exist. So one of the things I would recommend to you is when, whenever you're faced with life prolonging medications, you should ask your doctor, what is the number needed to treat? And you should base the decision as to whether you want to take that medication on what you feel is an appropriate number to treat. We deal with figures all the time. When we are buying a house, we'll say, OK, well, that's too expensive for me. If I buy this, it'll affect my quality of life. And there's no reason why we 
can't be empowered to make the same decisions about the medications we take. The interesting thing you will find is that the majority of doctors will not be able to tell you what the number needed to treat is. Uh, and that's incredible. And if someone asks me, oh, what is the number needed to treat uh, by controlling the blood, by treating this, um, by taking this tablet for blood pressure, I will not be able to tell you that. And this is one of our inherent flaws that we give medications. We don't even actually realize exactly what the absolute benefit of that medication is. There is a website called www.thenent.com, the number needed to treat, thenent.com. And if you get a chance, do check this website out because it'll give you some eye-opening statistics on exactly what the benefits of these medications are. So I hope this helps. Uh, I would love to hear what you think about it. Um, and I'm, as always, very grateful for everything you uh, uh, do for me. If you get a chance, please visit my website, which is www.yourcardiology.co.uk. And my Facebook page is Your Cardiology One. Um, and if you uh, can, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel, which is Your Cardiology. Thank you so much. All the best.